Hello, everyone, and welcome again to Savage School Live. We're so glad to have you back with us today, and um, I hope you had a great week. Uh, Dr. Taylor, how are you doing today? Good, Pastor McGraw. It's good to be back with you. It's good to be back uh, with the distinguished and intelligent panelists we have. It's always a blessing to be on this uh, panel discussion because even though we're going over familiar passages of Scripture, familiar stories, there's always something new presented in a new light that I get from, from this experience and from listening to those uh, who share. So I'm grateful to be a part of this this morning. Yes, and we're so glad to um, have each and every one of you here. We're here today, and we have uh, Dr. Moses, Dr. King, Dr. Lashley, and we have a special guest with us today, and the name, I will begin that with you uh, shortly. And so, uh, what, what we're going to do, we're going to open up with a, a word of prayer and ask the Holy Spirit to be with us at this time. So as we pray, let us uh, invite the Holy Spirit to be with us. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to thank you so much for being with us today. And Lord, we thank you so much again for the Sabbath school lesson. And now, Lord, as we go into lesson 10, uh, Jacob Israel, Lord, I pray that you will help us to, uh, as uh, Dr. Taylor said, to apply things to our life today, and we thank you so much for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. 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 And so the lesson that we're diving into today uh, is entitled Jacob Israel. I think there's a little, if, if uh, the panelists, if you can mute, uh, I think there's an echo. Uh, thank you. Uh, the title for this lesson, lesson 10, Jacob Israel. And, and this is an amazing lesson because oftentimes, I couldn't help but, you know, growing up listening to this story um, through the different stages of my life, wondering mm. why is it that God would allow a human being to wrestle with him all night when he could easily just take him out, mm -hmm. right? And, and the thing that, the, the, the theme that I've gotten from this lesson and from Sunday in particular, is that there are going to be times in our lives where God wants us to wrestle with him. Sometimes we want a quick fix. We want to pray, and then we want a testimony and testify and move on. Yeah. And sometimes we have to go through a, 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 a gauntlet. Sometimes we have to go through days on end with prayer. Sometimes we have to go through fasting. Sometimes we have to, sometimes it has to be a long, drawn-out experience for our own spiritual benefit. Mm. And so here, we know the family dynamics. We know that there was, um, in the household of Isaac, dysfunction. Mm -hmm. We know Isaac favored um, Esau. We know Rachel favored Jacob. We know the different personality traits. We know that even within the two brothers, there was dysfunction. Esau looked at the birthright as a means of getting the material blessings. His focus was on the, the temporal, as evident by the fact that he was willing to trade in his birthright for his temporal satisfaction, mm -hmm. getting lentils to satisfy his hunger for the moment. And it wasn't until when he came to a census he realized, wait a minute, I, uh, you know, Jacob just deceived our father, and so now Jacob is living, living in perpetual fear. And I can't help but think of you know, the fact that there might be someone watching today who may have been going through something for a long period of time, uh, maybe they're dealing with some kind of family dysfunction, tension uh, between siblings, tension between uh, parent and children, tension between uh, ex-spouses or current spouses, uh, all kinds of tension that could take place. And so here we have tension. Jacob, of course, lives in perpetual fear for his life because Esau can take, come and, and, and seek revenge. And, and, and so it's in this moment 
that we find Jacob at a moment of desperation when he's reached rock bottom. And, and there are moments in our lives when we re, where we you know, don't have any alternative moves. Mm-hmm. And the only place that we can find ourselves is on our knees in prayer. Yeah. And so Jacob finds himself in this position. And despite all that happens, the story of Jacob is one that shows us that God is faithful to fulfill what he has promised and that he will do so despite what at times seems to be nothing but his people doing all that they can to stop that fulfillment. And so we see Jacob going through his own gauntlet with being deceived by Laban, right? He he got a taste of his own medicine. Laban deceived Jacob uh, when he gave him not not, uh, the wife that he had worked for seven years for, but the sister, Leah. And so now Jacob is in a situation where he's distressed. He's felt like, you know, he's already experienced the hard end of life. Um, And now he... um, finds himself in a position where it's not just him but that's in jeopardy, but his whole family. Mm-hmm. And it just, you know, sometimes the mistakes that we make, we don't even realize the consequences that are going to take place, not just for us, but for those behind us, Yeah, for those that we connect ourselves with. And so Jacob now has the stress on his, on his this great burden. And, and, and you know, it's, it's in this moment where the Jesus, um, Jacob is wrestling with this angel at night, and he refuses to let go. And amid the fighting, it must have become obvious, the lesson points out, to Jacob that he was struggling with God himself as his words, I will not let you go until you bless me, Genesis thirty-two twenty-six. 26. Um, yet his fervent clinging to God, his refusal to let go, also his passionate desire for forgiveness and to be right with his Lord was evident. And we have to exhibit those traits. We cannot just give up easily. We can't say, God, you know, I, I, you know, I wanted this for so long. God, I wanted... Uh, to be free of this for so long. God, I needed deliverance in this area of my life, mm-hmm. and I haven't gotten it, so I'm just going to give up on you. We can't afford to, 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 to be so fickle with God because what's if, as, as long as Jacob wasn't giving up, God was still wrestling with him. That's the beauty of this story to me. And so I want to throw this question out to the panelists. What has been your own experience uh, wrestling with God uh, you know, as it pertains to something that you know, we've been praying for maybe for years? And, and we find ourselves in a situation where, you know, everything that we've done to try to achieve the ends has failed. And now it's, it's like, God, you know, I, I, I did all kinds of things. I tried to do things right. And st- things are still not working out for me. I feel like just giving up at this moment. What was it that kept you going? What was it that kept you wrestling with God? Anyone? And panelists, if you could just unmute. I'm sorry about that. This, mm-hmm. this is Dr. Moses. Um, I, w- I was just thinking about, I had a time in my life when I had some issues going on. And I had to really decide if I was going to trust God or not. And it was really hard to do that because um, I was very young. I had lost a child. And um, it, it was just too hard at the time to really make that decision. And so for a while, I just kind of floated around, really. And um, it took friends of mine to help me to find my way. So, you know, that is one time when I know I really did, um, um, I really did. I really had to, I had a big struggle trying to believe that God was even there for me and, and to allow myself to hear him talking to me because he had been talking to me all along. I just refused to hear it. And uh, my friends helped me through that. Amen. Amen. And what's, what's interesting with the story is that Jacob found himself in this dilemma because he tried to take things in his own hands. Yeah. You know, and, and one of the things uh, that, um, you know, when I looked at the Sabbath part of the lesson, it reminded me of the old statement. I don't know if, uh, you know, you're familiar with it or not, but it says, you know, God will work with us, through us, around us, or in spite of us. So, so whatever God has uh, promised is going to come to pass. And so, you know, th- like you said, there's a lesson so rich in a lot of things. And uh, we, we have from Greenville, uh, North Carolina, uh, Todd uh, choir. Todd, are, are you uh, on the line? Yes, I am. 
Okay, uh, would, would you tell us about uh, Sunday Wrestling with God? Can you, can you just uh, give us some insights on that? Yeah, so um, dealing with this lesson, uh, you know, it's talking about um, Laban and Jacob and the experience that, that uh, you know, obviously that Jacob had uh, when he was wrestling with God and his experience, um, you know, when he was when he was wrestling with God because We look at on his journey back, um, you know, on his journey back when Jacob, uh, his conversion, he was converted from Jacob to Israel. So that's something that I think we often miss is this, you know, there's a conversion experience that Jacob ha had. And, you know, he told God that, look, I'm not going to, I'm not going to leave until you bless me. Right. Mm -hmm. So he's having one of those moments where it was a moment is described as a, you know, a, a yes, God, that, you know, I'm not, that I need you. Um, and I'm, I'm going to stick with you no matter what, mm. you know? So oftentimes in our lives, we have those experiences where like she was saying, like, you know, I don't know what's going to happen, but I know you're going to bless me. So, you know, my attitude is lately is, you know, I pray every day that, you know, God's going to give me favor and blessings and abundance because it's part of that, that, that covenant, that um, part of that covenant, that, that, the Abrahamic covenant that he said he would bless us. So the same thing that, that Jacob was wrestling with God in his conversion experience because it takes that to have a conversion experience. And that's what he was going through, that conversion experience. Because um, if you look at the bottom about the error that had led to Jacob's sin was obtaining his birthright by fraud and clearly set before him. So a lot of that was, uh, you know, he was, he felt uh, like we do, if you do something wrong, then you feel uh, that, you know, you feel that you don't want to betray the other person. So he was wrestling like, I'm going to betray, um, you know, I'm going to betray my brother, but I'm betraying God. So that's that wrestling part that he was dealing with on his conversion experience. And oftentimes we deal with that in our conversion experiences and what we're going through with our life, because we all have some that we're, something that we're wrestling against. A lot of times it's people, places, and things that we wrestle against. And that's what he said, you know, talks about his mercies are anew uh, daily. And so it's one of those experiences that as he wrestled with God, uh, you know, as he went through, he was going through his, um, his dismay, his trials, that he became closer uh, with God in that experience. So I think that happens uh, in our own lives, that we become closer with God as we wrestle with God in our experiences. So. You know, this is uh, a powerful because this is obviously relative to me. I, you know, talked about my wife going through cancer, COVID, and just uh, tuning things out the last two years since pandemic has really helped my experience in wrestling with God. Is you know I, that that mindset is I'm not gonna leave until you bless me. So having that mindset that you know want to be in God's will, and we have to be still to be in His will, just mm. like Jacob did. Jacob, like he said, had that conversion experience where, he, you know, God wrestled with him. He said, Jacob, and then he told him Israel, right? So oftentimes that's that wrestling that uh, he's talking about, that ex that experience for him from Jacob to Israel, that conversion experience that we all, um, you know, take place, or that we all take place in as we go through this journey called life. So those are a few of the, you know, a summary uh, of, of Sunday's lesson. Uh, that kind of emphasizes the importance of, of as we wrestle, um, you know, as we're wrestling against God. And thankful for that. Yeah, and thank you so very much. And something uh, that you brought out that had me thinking as you were talking, you know, as he was Jacob, he said he wrestled with God and with men and he prevailed. Now, you know, we, we always focus on, you know, the wrestling with the angel or wrestling with God. What is this wrestling with men thing? Uh, how, how how does that play in uh, as far as prevailing? Uh, anyone have any thought on that? You know, wrestling with with men can can, can wrestling with with men um, you know bring us a conversion experience? You know, I I grew up in the days when you know wrestling was real. You know, with uh, Dusty Rose, uh, Wildfire, Tommy Rich, and you know Junkyard Dog. You know, that's when wrestling was real. This old fake stuff they got now. You know, I don't know where that came from. But back when wrestling was real, I used to watch that stuff. And so when it comes to wrestling with men and wrestling with God. I thought that was kind of interesting. 
how is it that he pre he prevailed in wrestling with men? Anyone have any uh, 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 ideas on that, uh, Doctor Lashley? What, 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 what do you what do you th get with his wrestling with men? Well, I, I think to wrestle with men, one must first wrestle with God always, so that there is that peace and that comfort. And I noticed that as he wrestled with his brother, in a way, he wanted to exchange, you know, it was more earthly thing. Okay, I'm going to give you something, I'm going to get something. He mm -hmm. hasn't gotten to that point yet of forgiveness. So in wrestling with man, one needs first to see oneself. Two, one needs to seek forgiveness of God. Before you can wrestle across laterally, you got to wrestle upward vertically. Mm. So you go upward to go outward. You don't go outward first and then go upward after. I think very often we go outward first to go upward. But let's go upward, then outward, and the triangle is completed. So the wrestle with man is completed in a triangular form by going up to God, back down to man, and then back and forth in a nutshell. I would think that wrestling okay. with man okay. has those triangular components. Wrestle up, wrestle out, and then everything will flow. Up, out, flow. Up, out, flow. That, that, that sounds like an exercise, exercise routine. routine. Up, routine. out, flow. Up, up out, out, flow. That's. Up, out, flow. Up, out, flow. Okay. Can I just add? I, 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 oh. I agree, Dr. Lashley. I, I just need to correct my brother, uh, Pastor Pastor Owen, on, on one thing. Wrestling has never been real. Okay, oh, come on now. Let's, let's just keep going. Okay, okay. Now, now, now I'm hurt. Now, now, now I, okay, <laughs> I get, I, th thank you. I got to pray about this once this is over. <laughs> Let me just add, you know what's interesting about this whole, this whole story? Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets that Jacob had reached such a low point that when he gets to the to the wilderness, he he literally physically bows his head mm -hmm. to the ground, and there's a there's a depth of dis, of desperation that he gets to, so that he can't help but exhibit humiliation. Mm -hmm. He can't help but 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 surrender and repent. He can't help but let go of self dependency, right? And and so you see in him qualities you know that that he didn't exhibit earlier in the story when mm -hmm. he's scheming with his mother to deceive Isaac, right? Um, there was this kind of uh, justification that, look, because you're focused on the spiritual part of this, this birthright, you deserve this birthright. This is, your, this is yours. Um, and you should go ahead and, you know, by hook or by crook, get this thing to, yeah. to happen. And, you know, there's a lack of, humili of humility in order to carry out such a plan. Mm -hmm. And you see a complete 180 by the time you get to the Jacob we're talking about today who's now wrestling with God. Because when we think of wrestling, we think one is trying to defeat the other. But what's interesting in this, in this situation is that God wanted Jacob to keep going. God wanted Jacob to hold on. And this is evident by the fact that once the morning came, he touches Jacob's hip and what happens? He becomes, a, he becomes crippled immediately. Mm -hmm. and, and Jacob now is weeping, please don't let me, don't let me go until you give me a blessing. Okay. It's a moment of desperation that exhibits the kind of mindset we have to have when it comes down to, to prayer. Um, and, 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 you know, a lot of times we think of God as an option. Mm -hmm. And sometimes this story lets me know that God has to take us to the brink of, 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 of you know, trouble before we realize God is not an option. God is the only option. Uh, and then, you know, things would flow from there. But we have to see God as the top one to go to before we turn to ourselves and decide, okay, what am I going to do? How am I going to calculate and get around this troubling time right now? You know, and so, something that uh, Brother Todd brought out, and, and it's kind of interesting, something you just said, the way the angel had um, touched his, his hip. You know, we often see the picture where they're like locking hands with each other. They're, you know, like, uh, you know, holding each other by the hand or by the wrist or whatever. But you know, as I was reading, I kind of got the impression that when Jacob was wrestling with him, you know, basically he, he was, in, you know, like a, like a strong embrace or, or something like that. You know, I guess, I guess you know, it's, it's like when you embrace, uh, you know, to keep something from happening. So, so when the lesson brings it out, that kind of, you know, got me to that point of thinking like that. It said he was um, fervently clinging to God. 
So when he was clinging to him, you know, when you cling to someone, you know, it's, it's like an embrace, okay? And then also Jacob uh, says, the lesson says that he had a refusal to let go. Mm. You know, and, and when we wrestle with God, we got to cling to him. We got to refuse to let him go. And also we have to desire forgiveness. Right. Out of all the things that Jacob had, had been through, you know, he, he was, you know, like you were bringing out, he wrestled with a lot of things. He, you know, even when um, his, his mother, uh, you know, uh, talked about, you know, getting the birthright, he, he, he wrestled with that idea. You know, uh, you know, is this thing right or is it not? He, when he went in with his father, he wrestled with deceiving his father. You know, he, he wrestled with, you know, uh, doing this to, uh, to his brother. He wrestled with Laban. You know, so all this wrestling he did. So, so you know, he had a lot of things weighing on him. Yeah. So, so he was wrestling with men in his mind, you know, all the things he went through. But, but through all that, he was desiring uh, for forgiveness. Amen. And then also, lastly, the lesson says that he wanted to be right with God. Yeah. You know, when we wrestle with God, you know, these four things that the lesson brings out, clinging to him, refusal to let go, desire forgiveness, you know, not only, you know, of, of God, but, you know, of our fellow men. And also, uh, ultimately, we want to be right with God. Yeah. Because, and, you know, uh, his life could, you know, like you said, you know, God could have snuffed him out. Exactly. But, but, he, but he didn't. He had mercy on him. Exactly. And I can't help but see parallels with Jacob and Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane. Both were in a position where the, the thought of God abandoning them was so great. The fear of God abandoning them was so great that they literally poured out their all in this prayer. And, and so I can't help but see Jacob in this particular moment in his life as a, t a type for Christ and, what was, what, and, and you know, showcasing what Christ was going to endure just before the cross when he was saying, you know, not my will, but, but, but you know, take, pass this, like, take this cup away from me, yet not my will, but your, let your will be done, Lord. And I, you know, throughout the Bible there are parallels, of course, as it pertains to Christ, but I just see this particular story mm -hmm. just paralleling the Garden of Gethsemane so well. Yeah, and, and, and the thing about it, you know, God answered his prayer because his name was changed. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and, and that, that should be comfort to, to a lot of people that, that our names are going to be changed. It's, it's no, longer, no longer what has been assigned to us, but what God is going to give to us. And, you know, and, and we have to you know, just, just hold on to that. So uh, as, as we go on, you know, let, let's go on um, to Monday's uh, lesson, uh, Dr. Lashley, uh, the brothers meet. Let, let's talk about the brothers meeting. There's a whole agreement now. You know, the brothers, of course, are at war. It's 20 years have passed. And I kept thinking, wow, how do we do this in the church? 20 years have passed. There are still Seventh-day Adventists. They're worshiping in separate churches and they're going their own ways. It's been 20 years, but you get to that point in your older age when you say, you know what, let me make things right. And so Jacob says, well, what do I have? He looks around him and he has all this wealth. I took time and added up his wealth. He had 340 cattle with 736,000 US. He's gonna make a gift of 736,000 US to his brother to appease him. He's selling half his land. Here's the guy that stole the birthright. He's sorry now, but he wants to bring it back on the level of, of material. So he's gonna give him 736,000 US worth of mules, rams, camels, cows, bulls, asses, and young donkeys. $736 worth. But he's preparing without God. Said, so you know what? In case he attacks me, let me send one half of my people to the south, one half to the north. In case he gets one, he won't get both. Let me do that. And then let me meet him and beg him. Let me send my messengers ahead. And when he sends the other brethren to talk to Esau, he finds out that Esau has 400 AY youth leaders all armed to the teeth. And they are going to knock on, they are going to knock on Jacob's church door and they're marching to the design, but they're coming for Jacob. And man, can you imagine the tension? And if you read the passage again in chapter 33, here is what Jacob does. For me, it's significant. He sets out for war again. He says, you know what? Let me put the lowest first. And so he puts the handmaids and they turn out in front. 
And then he puts, guess who next? Leah, because you don't really like her. He puts her next. And he keeps Rachel and Joseph and Benjamin for the last in the back of the line, just in case there is trouble. And can you imagine these two brethren coming together and they camp out and they meet the next day and they see each other and they plan a fight and as they see each other, everything changes. And they hug up and start bawling and shouting and everybody says hallelujah and they're having church. That's what it means by penitence. But to get to that point, Jacob had to go up mm. to God in Peniel first. Had he not done that, there would have been no agreement. Lesson for us. We are going to have issues as brethren, whether between us, whether organizationally or whatever. If we have an issue, let us take it to the Lord first. Amen. Because I see something else here. For example, Jacob took things into his own hands. You know why? His grandmother did too. She took things into her own hands. His son Joseph took things into his own hands. He spoke about the dream. He, he was boasting. He got to Moses. His relative. He took stuff in his own hand. He killed a man. <laughs> so these guys have a dysfunctional generational problem of taking stuff into their own hands despite God's assurance. And each time, God forgives them. God allows them. But God, when he forgives you, he also puts you to the test. He is going to forgive you, but he is going to have that test pass across your path again. And so the whole idea now of agreement coming together, you must first go up before you go out. Once you go up, you ask for forgiveness. Stage two, you go up to talk. Forgiveness to go out three, and then when you see the other person, hug them up and start bawling and crying and singing. Amen. You, so that's my idea of what happened there, and therefore what should happen now. So the question I have for us, well, <laughs> when we have issues, do we go up first or do we go out first? Which one? Do we go up first or do we go out? Not a trick question. Should hmm. we go up to God first or should we meet the brother first or talk with the brother? What's the answer? Well, Dr. Well, Dr. Dr. Lesley, Dr. Lesley, you, you, you already know you the already answer know to that. that. For most of us, For most of us we go, we we go, go out with we go first. Out we don't go up with first. first. That's why we That's need to study our lessons and we need to get a lesson from this from the lesson. That we can apply, we can to, our apply to our lives because we because need to we go need up to with go first up because first. we can't handle, can't out, handle with out correctly, with correctly if we don't if go, we up, don't with go up with first and sometimes, and sometimes we are just like the 20 years, 20 years. I, i've known I've people, people who have not have spoken not in the church, in the church for, 20, for 20 30 40, 40 years. years but they still call but themselves Well, so you, you know that. You know that. Oh yeah, yeah. He 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 knows he knows the answer to that. But but like you said, you bring us uh, to to reality, just like you told me. You know, wrestling is not real. Um, and, and thank you for that. But but you know, you 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 gave the the, the realistic thing that uh, we often you know like uh, Doctor Lashley said, we take the matters into our own hands. And you know, I never thought you know put put all that together because you know Abraham took things in, into his own hands. Uh, uh, Sarah. You know, and and then then uh, his mother, uh, uh, you know, Jacob's mother took things in, into her own hands. Then you know he took things in, into you know now he's taking things into his own hands. You know, so 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 it's it's, it's a generational thing, and and you know it's, it's it's in the DNA. But when he went upward, when he went upward, when he was you know uh, when he met his brother Esau, that's when things changed because um, you know because it says you know when when he met Esau. He bowed down to him. Yeah. You know what's interesting is that while Jacob is wrestling, before he even says, before, bless me, or I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me, God already went before and gives a, a dream to Esau. Mm -hmm. And in the dream shows Esau the years 
of, of, of stress and turmoil that Jacob has endured, the mm -hmm. mental ang anxiety, the, the, the anguish this man endured for years. And Esau, his heart is softened as a result of God going before Jacob, before Jacob even asks. And so that gives me hope because this story exhibits not just the power of prayer, but it shows you what happens when you engage in serious prayer. God already has gone before. Before you can even form your lips to make the request, God has gone before and he's already made, he's already set things in order, yeah. set the ducks in a row so that when the blessing comes, things just flow naturally. You know, a lot of times we can focus on just the embraces if Esau just miraculously and weirdly. But Esau saw, uh, it was like a movie. He saw all that he, his brother experienced since the time he left home. And he couldn't help mm -hmm. but feel sorry for him. And now he's... The, the same Esau who's only focused on the temporal is now look, thinking about his brother in such a way where he can't, he feels sorry for what he, his brother went through. And he feels sorry that his brother was afraid of him for all these years. That is a, it's a beautiful story, you know? And it's also an example because we can make the same mistake as Esau in trading in our birthright for the temporal. Yeah. Trading in what we know to be, you know, truth. Trading in our, uh, you know, the, the standards that God has for us in the Word of God, for the for, for for the sake of having a good time now, for the sake of being able to develop a reputation now, amongst our peers, amongst our fellow men, and and it just goes to show you that those things Esau, you know, at the end of it, wasn't the one that Jesus Christ's lineage came through. It was Jacob. Yeah, and and the thing about it, uh, even with this story. Just, just think about it. God, God did not, you know, reveal to to Jacob that He revealed to Esau the dream. Cause just think if if Jacob may have had that revealed to him, he may have stopped doing what what he was supposed to as far as getting right. So, you know, um, so I'm so glad that God doesn't reveal everything to me, because you know I can stop dead in my tracks instead of you know moving forward to what He wants me to do, and mess up what He's doing, you know, ahead of me before I get there. And it just goes to show you what, what Jacob went through is symbolic of what we're going to go through in our final struggle with the powers of evil. Okay. You know, God is going to test our faith and, and, and our perseverance is going to be put up to the test, especially in the last days. Oh, yes. And, and so Jacob is an example for us. Jacob shows us what is going to happen when you remain persistent and relentless in the pursuit of God's standards and of God's character and of his presence and his forgiveness. All right. All right, so so let, let's go on to uh, Tuesday, Tuesday, the violation of Dinah, uh, Doctor Moses. Hello, um, I was I was tasked, and and I I, I really enjoyed this story about um, Dinah, not because of what happened, because what happened was really horrible. Mm -hmm. But it gives us an idea that no matter how close we are to God, sometimes we still make big mistakes. Mm. And and this one was a big mistake. And the mistake started actually with Jacob mm -hmm. because he moved to an area where God told him not to move, first of all. And... Um, and because he was in, he, because he was too close to um, this other group of people, it caused um, havoc. So Jacob was wanting to have peace. That's that's what was on his mind. Is I just want to be someplace where it's peace and quiet. I live in the country. I prefer living in the country because it's peaceful. It's quiet. You have to literally walk to. Um, somebody to the next house you can't just look out your door and yell across the you know across the window so i really enjoy that and um um and so but he wanted to have peace but he moved too close to um to the area where god told him not to be those people wanted to be friends they wanted to intermarry they wanted to do all these things his daughter went to um you know go to the mall whatever it was she was planning to do that mm -hmm. day she went there and uh the king's son saw her liked her wanted her took her mm. and um and and violated her and then after all of that 
he decided that he loved her and he wanted to marry her. So the family, you know, the, the king went to Jacob. They had this conversation and, and all of that. But it was decided that no, because they were not, you know, Israelites. But even before that, when Jacob found out that his daughter had been raped, he did nothing. You know, he did nothing. His sons were out um, doing their jobs. He didn't send somebody to go and let them know that there was a problem. Um, he just waited till they came back and, you know, after dinner or whatever, then said, well, guess what happened? And, and it was just really, the boys were really upset, which I can understand mm -hmm. because um, I have sons and I can imagine that um, how my sons would have reacted you know, if one of their um, cousins, that had happened to their cousins or their sisters or something. So anyway, if you read, you have to read Genesis 33 and 34 to get the whole gist of, of what happened and what led up to it and how it happened. And you, um, once you see that, then you'll see how everything fell into place because things were done wrong. So once, um, once it was discovered what had happened, the, the young man said, you know, he wanted to marry her. And, and so Jacob's sons were saying, well, you're not circumcised. You're not a part of us. He says, well, I'll do that. And then all, and they wanted everybody to do it. So Jacob is thinking, oh, this is going to be great. You know, everybody's going to become, you know, um, lovers of God and blah, blah, blah. Well, the boys were all were already had a plan in mind that had absolutely nothing to do with being in love with God, you know? Mm -hmm. So, so all the men got circumcised. The boy still came and said, I really want to marry your, I love your daughter. You know, I know I did wrong, but I want to, you know, I want to marry her. They all got circumcised when the boys felt like the men were at their weakest from the surgeries they went in and mm. killed everybody mm. out of spite. Mm. You know, it was out of spite. It was not a, a God directive. They did not discuss it with their with the rest of their family. The two, the um the two boys that were actually her brothers were the ones that went to revenge their sister. And they killed everybody and um took all their things and whatever. And so now Jacob is upset, but what can he do? The damage has already been done. And so, and so now he has a concern that all the other areas around them are, are going to attack them or whatever. But what happened, God um, put a, I, I don't know what they call it these days, but they put a notice out to say, nobody will bother these people. And so all of the people were afraid <laughs> because they heard. Yeah. They, um, because they had heard what those sons had done, they were all afraid. So there was no way that Jacob could make friendships with any of the countries because none of the countries wanted to be bothered. And sometimes we do that in our own lives. Instead of seeking guidance, um, from God or man, we just go out and do things on our own. And then we're surprised at the repercussions of what we have done, you know? And I thought it was interesting that, um, I think it was Dr. Lasky was saying how um, within the church, you know, we have um, all of these separations and everything and people not talking to people, but we have the same thing, even in families, we have that same problem. And, and, and it shows in here because the brothers didn't go and talk to all their other brothers. They, well, that's probably another story where mm -hmm. they all talked when they, you know, you know, when they dumped Joseph in the hole, they all talked then, but, but that was afterwards. So I, I don't want to tell the story later, but anyway, um, you know, they, they didn't talk. If they had talked, they might've come up with a better solution, but they went on adrenaline and they made a big mistake that caused a lot of problems as opposed to peace for Jacob and his family. Yeah, and, and, and also, as you were saying earlier, I, I think a lot of that could have been uh, prevented 
if if Jacob had um, moved when he uh, when he first heard about it. And that's one of the things that I, I want to uh, encourage all of us, you know, because uh, there there was an incident that um, my my daughter came to me and told me something had happened uh, at school, and so um, so you know I had, I had a choice to make, and the choice I had to make is you know I had to uh, you know you know go and investigate and and defend my daughter, because one thing about it, on a, when she comes to me with that information. How Daddy deals with that is how much she's going to trust Daddy after that. And so, with that being said, um, you know it, it's, it's incumbent upon us that when we hear, you know, our, our sons and our daughters, you know, something has happened, you know, uh, we, we need to act on it. As, you know, for, because we we need to protect them. Um, and and when I say protect them, you know, we need to find out what's going on, mm -hmm. and then also, you know, we we need to act on it. Uh, to to see what we can do to uh, uh, correct, prevent, or whatever, but but I had to do what I had to do because I knew that you know you know uh, ha however I, tr I dealt with this is how my daughter is going to look at me uh, from now on. Right. You know, can can I trust Daddy? Can, you know, would Daddy protect me? So uh, a lot of these things could have been prevented if if Jacob you know could could have acted uh, you know uh, on that and and and, and even later on uh, you know. As we look in, in the narratives, you know, uh, David did the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when we read about you know what happened, you know, with, with Absalom, you know, uh, when he took matters in, into his own own hands about his sister, you know, so so th there are things that we need to do as far as preventative. You know, is when we hear about information, we need to step in and step up. Yeah. But but uh, I want to go back to what Dr. Lashley said, uh, along with that stepping up. You know, um, God, you know, you need to help me because, like someone said earlier, you know, I don't want to be running off of adrenaline. Because if I run off of adrenaline, you know, uh, somebody's going to get hurt, and, and, and me also. And, you know, what's interesting is that when Ellen White talks about this story in Patriarchs and Prophets, she, she, there's a powerful quote in the, in the chapter, and it's, He who seeks pleasure among those that do not fear God is placing himself on Satan's ground and inviting his temptations. That's deep. Because what we see is that, just like you said, Pastor, Jacob shouldn't have had tarried in that area in the first place. Because mm -hmm. there's always a what if. You know, every time tragedy happens, I yeah. can't help but think of what if things that just, what if someone just decided not to take that course of action? It would be a totally different scenario today. If Jacob decided to just keep it moving, mm -hmm. you know, as opposed to let's see what they have, what's going on, this would have been a totally different story. And you can't help but think that there was an influence because there mentions that, the, the the idolatry practices were prevalent among these people, and even found a foothold in Jacob's house. Yeah. And, so yeah. And 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 and, um, and Dr. King's going to talk about that on, on Wednesday. So 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 tell us about that. You know, that's, that's a good segue into Wednesday. Uh, Dr. King, t tell us about this prevailing uh, idolatry that, that led into this, and and also you know uh, add, add into it because uh, we only have a few minutes left about you know. Um, how we need to be careful dealing too much on the what if, because dealing on the what if can you know can keep us from moving forward or or even recovering uh, what what we have messed up. But 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 go go ahead. Well, I, I you know I know we only have a few minutes left. I I just wanted to say very quickly deceit after deceit in this family. Oh, mm. uh, that was deception after deception. But even at looking at that, we can take hope. We can take hope in knowing that in our dysfunctional families, mm -hmm. that there is still hope for us. I'm Amen. telling you, after reading this story, I even it's an oxymoron to see how, how it's a blessing and a curse all at the same time. But anyway, um, this, this, this thing about idolatry, you know, the thing I want to bring out very quickly, because, you know, Jacob had to move from, from the place where he was, and he had to go back to where God told him to go. His peace with the Canaanites was not real because it was built on deception from the very beginning. But, um, you know, it says that these idols had been kept and probably worshipped in spite of Jacob's commitment to God. And it goes on to point out to us that these idols are not just uh, physical idols. You know, we don't need to just get rid of physical things. We have to let God purge us from the adultery in our hearts and that's what this whole lesson and this whole thing this whole this whole christian walk that's what it's about all the outward show and all the outward things that we do if your heart is not when you say right with god 
That's all that means is just giving your heart to God and letting him change us from the way we are to what he needs us to be because we all have problems in our life, in our families. Um, I can I can just relate to some of these uh, liars and deceivers uh, in the families. But anyway, it says when God, when Jacob obeys God and proceeds according to God's commandment, God finally intervenes and the terror of God affects all the people around them and they do not dare attack Jacob. Jacob is then ready to worship with all the people who were with him. And so, so you know, we have to ask God to do for us the same thing that Jacob asked the people to do. Put away all your idols because pretty much anything can become an idol. I, I You know, we can name some things, but pretty much anything in your life can become an idol. Anything you put before God can become an idol. So we, you know, we just want to ask God to put away these subtle things in our lives and find his way into our hearts so that we can truly worship the true God of heaven. My goodness, this thing was so packed. I, I know I, I, you know, we only have a few minutes and I can't do it justice, but we have to really put away all idols out of our lives whether that be, um, you know, church principles or, you know, traditions or whatever it is, mm -hmm. whatever it is, if it's not, if it's not from God himself, we have to recognize that and ask God to purge it from our hearts and create in us a clean heart so that we can worship the true God. Yeah. And, and also, uh, as, as you were uh, talking, it, 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 you know, when, when we talk about putting things before God, we also have to uh, talk about things that, um, and it might be the same thing. I might, I might be, you know, um, you know, dealing with semantics, but anything that replaces God, you know, yes. that, 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 that's, that's something else. You know, what, what yes. do we have in our lives that's taken the place of God? You know, not, not, not be, only what's coming be before him, anything. but, but what's, what's taking his place in, in it, lieu it of God. It could be just about anything. It, it could it, be a ritual that you have that you think is, you know, but, but, but you're more, you're more invested in the ritual than you are worshiping the God that you're supposed, you know, that, that's supposed to be the God that you're worshiping. Sometimes we, we don't even realize that we have set up idols. You know, sometimes we, we don't, we don't realize, you know, but, but, but Jacob asked the people to get rid of their idols, to take the earrings out of their ears. You know, I guess people were worshiping their jewelry and, and, and he asked them to get rid of all of this so that they could, they could, you know, get purged in their hearts and worship the true God. And I just think that that is something that we here today need to do as well, you know, and just about anything, your child can become something that you worship before God, your, your spouse. I mean, anything, just about anything can become an idol. Yeah. And, and, and I like uh, what, what the lesson brings out. It says uh, the process of repentance consists in more than just a physical move from one place to another or a move mm -hmm. from one church to another. Mm -hmm. You know, like yeah, you said, it's all, those, it's, it's all, all about hoppers. the heart. Yeah, that's for all those church hoppers. Something goes wrong here at this church and they figure, oh, I'm going to leave and go to another church. Well, if you take the same attitude and the same spirit and the same heart that you have with you to the next church, then you're going to find that you're going to have some of the same problems. So, so it's not about moving from place to place. It's about the Holy Spirit moving upon your heart. Yeah. And, and one thing uh, we have to realize, you know, just like you said in the book of Job, you know, uh, you know, uh, God asked, you know, uh, you know, Satan, uh, where, where you been? He said, walking to and fro oh, about it. Mm -hmm. so, so, so no matter where you go, the devil's going to follow you. That's so, right. <laughs> That's you know, right. until you overcome him, you know, he's going to continue to follow you and throw out those same uh, temptations that uh, you, you've you been dealing with and, and that you've been, you know, um, basically we got to get, get we have to get rid of the idols in our heart, you know, That's whatever right. it is. But uh, right. we got about two minutes left. So we got to uh, wrap this up. So, um, you know, Pastor, I guess I could touch on Thursday a little bit because Thursday also brings more dysfunction into the picture mm -hmm. as Reuben is having um, sexual relations with uh, his father's concubine. And, and what the lesson points out is that 
Jacob doesn't respond to this horrible violation, mm-hmm. and it's likely because he understands at this point in his life that God, that, that 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 God will fulfill His word despite the sin and evil that seems to rise up time and time again in his home. What's also interesting, and I couldn't help but think about this, is that Jacob was so surprised by the vengeful spirit that his sons had to commit, like we talked about for Tuesday's mm-hmm. lesson, that. It, it, he shuddered in his soul, and he couldn't help but ask for, for forgiveness from, from God. I couldn't help but think, if, God, if Jacob saw what they're capable of, why did he send Joseph later in the story by himself to go and deliver a message, knowing that these folks were jealous of Joseph? But that's just neither here nor there. We'll get to that when we get to Joseph. But yeah. you know, it just, it just, this lesson just stresses the point home that prioritizing God as number one is crucial. It's crucial in our life because that void is going to be filled with something. And, you know, back to the quote I mentioned earlier with Ellen White says, if we open up, if we place ourselves, uh, you know, on, on the devil's playground, tragedy is going to come with temptations and, and things like that. You know, young people might be thinking, you know, why can't I go to, to the club on Friday night? What's the problem? It's just a place. Why can't I go to Coachella? Why can't I go to the concert? Why can't I do this? Why can't I do that? The problem, and I think the doctor mentioned it, is not just the place, but it's the fact that you're placing yourself in the environment Mm. So that these things happen because, look, all idolatry is persistent in these environments, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so when you place yourself in these in- environments, tragedy is, you know what I'm saying, is more prevalent among these, these, these areas because the people who do that, you're aligning yourself with people who don't fear God. Mm-hmm. So, look, the risks are there. And so, you know, that's just to bring a more practical tone uh, for those who may be, you know, probably young uh, watching the program today. Yeah, and, 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 I'm, and I'm glad you... You know, you, you talked about, you know, placing ourselves on the devil's play- playground. It made me think, you know, if, if we get on the devil's playground, he's going to kick sand in our eyes. And so we have to be careful, you know, of, 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 of what we do. Uh, but, but the thing about it is, uh, going back, we, we have to, uh, you know, go to God, stay with God, cling to him, and don't let go. Because that's the only way that we're going to make it through. Because uh, e- even though God has made promises... I want to be a part of the promise. I don't want to miss out on the promise. And so uh, we want to thank everyone for uh, tuning in and being with us again here on uh, Sabbath School Live here at the uh, South Atlantic Conference. And we want to thank all of our panel guests for being with us today. And also, uh, Dr. Taylor, I want to thank you for being uh, called today. And also, we want to uh, tell you to uh, you know, be safe because uh, no matter what they say, uh, the pandemic is, is still here. No matter what they say, no matter what they're trying to convince you of, uh, things are still happening as far as uh, COVID and, and, and other things that are happening. So uh, we want you to have a great Sabbath, a great day, and we will see you next week. And thank you so much for tuning in to South Atlantic Conference Sabbath School Live. Have a great Sabbath. Good morning, boys and girls. This is Dr. Big Guy, and welcome to South Atlantic Conference Children's Sabbath School. I want to remind you, always wear your mask when you go out and keep safe. I want to also let you know, every third Sabbath, we have Children's Church at 4 o'clock. Children's Church at 4 o'clock every third Sabbath on Zoom. All you need to do is go to South Atlantic Conference website and have your parents register you. It's a free program, and we look forward to having you participate with us. Again, That's every third Sabbath at 4 p.m. virtually. May God bless you and enjoy Sabbath school. Hello, boys and girls. This is Aunt Fernita, and I have a wonderful story for you called Jesus Goes to a Party. Today's memory verse is from Isaiah chapter 52, verse 9. It says, burst into songs of joy together. The message for today's story is we have fun with our family and friends. Do you like parties? Do you like to eat yummy food and play games with your family and friends? Jesus liked to have fun too. He liked to visit his family and his friends. Jesus and his friends were going to a party. No, it wasn't a birthday party. It was a wedding party. Where Jesus lived, When people got married, they had a party that lasted many days, so they had lots of food to eat and juice to drink. 
Some of Jesus' family came to this wedding party too. His mother Mary was there. She helped plan the party. And some of Jesus' special friends were there too. Everyone was having fun. Everyone except the people who planned the party. They were worried. The servants came to Mary and said, The juice is all gone. What should we do? The party will be ruined. The bride and the groom will be so embarrassed. Oh my, what can I do? Jesus' mother wondered. Mary turned and saw Jesus. Quietly she went to him and said, The juice is all gone. Jesus looked around. He saw some big water jugs. He spoke quietly to the servants and said, Go fill the big water jugs with water. They were puzzled. What good would that do? They wondered. But they did as Jesus said. When all the jugs were full, Jesus said to the servants, Take some to the person in charge of the party. The men poured some of the water into a cup. But it wasn't water anymore. It was juice. Good, sweet grape juice. Now there would be enough juice for the party. The servants took a nice, cool glass of the juice to the man in charge of the party. He tasted it, and then he drank it all. Mmm, this is such good juice, he said to the bridegroom. Most people serve the best juice at the beginning of the wedding feast, but you have saved the best until last. The servants were excited. Jesus' mother and his friends were pleased, and the bride and groom were happy too. Jesus' friends began talking among themselves about the miracle juice. This was Jesus' first miracle. They had seen his amazing power. But what would happen in the days ahead? Jesus showed love to the bride and the bridegroom, to his mother and to his friends. The happy times you have with your friends and family are special to Jesus too. We show love when we have fun with our family and friends. Hello everyone, this is Aunt Fernita. Today's story is called, Who is My Neighbor? The memory verse is from Luke chapter 10, verse 27. It says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and love your neighbor as yourself. The message is everyone is included in God's love. Jake sat down in an empty chair in the Sabbath school room. The other children were talking together, but Jake sat alone. He didn't know anyone. He felt out of place. No one spoke to him. His family had just arrived from a faraway country. He spoke with an accent. It hurt to be lonely. Why wouldn't anyone speak to him? In today's Bible lesson, Jesus told a story about a man who was hurting and needed help. Who would pay attention to him? The young lawyer stood up. He straightened his belt and cleared his throat. <clears throat> Teacher, what shall I do to have eternal life? What do the scriptures say? asked Jesus. That I should love God with all of my heart soul, strength, and mind, and love my neighbor as much as I love myself. The lawyer replied, You're right, Jesus said. Keep doing these things and eternal life is yours. But just who is my neighbor? questioned the young man. Let me tell you a story, said Jesus, smiling. Once there was a man who left Jerusalem to travel to Jericho, Along the way, robbers attacked him. They beat him. They took his money and clothes and left him lying in the hot sun, half dead. It just so happened that a Jewish priest was traveling the same way. 
A little later, he came to the place where the injured man was lying. Quickly, he looked away. He may have thought, Oh no, that man's in great pain. I can't tell if he is a Jew or not. I better hurry on. And the priest crossed to the other side of the road and went on his way. Soon, a Levite who worked in the temple came by. Curious, he stopped to look at the wounded man. Poor man, he may have thought. He looks terrible. I really ought to help him, but I don't want to get involved. I wish that I had not come this way. Surely someone else will help him. And the Levite hurried down the road. It wasn't long until a Samaritan came by. Jesus looked around. He knew that the Jewish people hated the Samaritans. But he continued. The Samaritan felt sorry for the poor man and stopped right away to help him. He gave him water. He put medicine on the man's wounds. He gently helped him up on his own donkey. Carefully, he took the injured man to the nearest inn, where he stayed with him through the night. In the morning, he gave the innkeeper money to take care of the hurt man. Let me know if that isn't enough, said the Samaritan. I'll gladly pay you more when I come this way again. Jesus looked into the young lawyer's eyes. Now, my friend, he quietly asked, which of the three was a neighbor to the wounded man? The one who helped him. The young man answered quietly. Jesus spoke kindly, Go, go now and be that kind of neighbor. Today, Jesus wants us to be good neighbors too. In God's eyes, every person is equal. Every person is someone to be loved and accepted no matter where they come from, how they sound when they speak, the color of their skin. This week, Ask Jesus to make your heart like His. Ask Him to help you show His love to your neighbor. within me bless his holy name good morning and happy sabbath saints of the most high god i want to extend a very warm welcome to our members and visitors who are worshiping with us this morning we are so delighted to have you join our south atlantic conference worship service it seems as though it was just yesterday and we were bringing in a new year now we are halfway through this year and to some it may have been filled with joy and sheer bliss to others it may have been difficult or even filled with despair but no matter your circumstances remember that god loves you 
and his sustaining power has kept you. So come, let us worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Come, let us give him the honor and the praise. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let us pray. Dear most gracious heavenly father, Lord, we come before you this morning with thanksgiving and praise. Thank you for bringing us through another week into another Sabbath. Thank you for blessing us as we travel to and fro. Your arms of protection have kept us safe from the enemy. Great is thy faithfulness. Thank you, Lord, for supplying our every need. Father, we stand in need of your grace mercy, and forgiveness, because our will has not always aligned with your will. We need help from on high. So please, Lord, as we worship today, may we feel your presence. Through the spoken word, take us deeper in a love relationship with you. Increase our faith and help us to surrender our all to you. Strengthen us where we are weak and where we lack wisdom, fill us with knowledge from on high. We thank you, Lord, for hearing and answering our prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to slow it down just a bit and sing more about Jesus. Anybody had enough of Jesus yet? Does anybody like him? Does anybody love him? Is he all the world to anybody? More, 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 more about Jesus. Let's lift our voices together as we sing this wonderful hymn, More About Jesus. Right here, More About Jesus. More, more about Jesus, I would know. More of his grace. More of his grace. To others show. More of his saving fullness, more of his love.
us one more time more about Jesus. Let me hear you. More about. I hear three of you. Everybody, more. There you go. More of his. You sound good. More. Come on, crowd. Let's do it one more time. Yeah, I wasn't sure at the beginning. More. More. Everybody, more of his saving. It's prayer time here in South Atlantic Conference, and there's much for us to pray for. We're asking that you gather around your computers, your TVs, your devices, and let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we take time to call on your name on this Sabbath morning. Lord, we humbly ask that you forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. We claim David's prayer to you when he says, give me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. We want that same anointing, God. We want the desire to love you. So please, Lord, give us a second chance and forgive us of our sins. Lord, on this morning, we thank you for your goodness to us. You have been a protector and a provider. You have been a healer and a comforter. So please accept our thanks for all the good things that you have done for us. And Lord, even if we don't recall the great things that you've done for us, you died on that cross for us, and that's enough. And so for that, we say thank you, God, on this morning. There are several things we'd like to lay before your feet today. Lord, in this country, there are several families who are suffering the pain of senseless gun violence. In Buffalo, in Texas, we even got news recently of a shooting in Chattanooga and Charleston. In the name of Jesus, comfort those families. There's really Nothing that can be said or done to soothe them of their grief. But I believe you can bring healing to the pain that they've experienced. I pray that you move government officials to make swift legislation to help us control this gun violence, God. May they have the courage to stand up for what is right. And I humbly ask for protection of our churches, our schools, and our gathering places. The war in Ukraine still rages on, and I pray in the name of Jesus that you bring peace to that area. In the name of Jesus, we just exited, Lord, graduation season, and I pray that you stand by every graduate, particularly the graduates who now move into the workforce. Lord, provide them jobs, provide them internships, Provide them opportunities that they truly enter to learn and now depart to serve. And we thank you for all of our graduates who have moved to the next level. Lord, we pray for our conference administration led by Elder Winston. We pray for all of the teachers and pastors. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we pray for all of the members in our churches in a special way. And Lord, please lay your hand on the young people of this conference who are now leading and growing in you. Lord, in the name of Jesus, I humbly ask that you save us when you come. I humbly ask, Lord, that one day we will be able to walk the streets of gold and be in the pearly gates. Lord, I ask you, God, that right now you prepare us for this time of trouble and that we will begin making choices that bring us closer to you. And we thank you for giving us a speaker today. And I pray that your anointing rests on them. 
We thank you, God, and we love you. Thank you for hearing our prayer from the South Atlantic Conference. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you all. Have a happy Sabbath. Why worship God today? Have you ever experienced deliverance by force from supernatural evil attacks? As a young boy, Eric struggled with frequent nightmares. He dreamed of attacks by strange animals that looked like some of the divinities worshipped in his culture. He would often wake up sweating and crying, and as soon as he went back to sleep, the nightmares would return. To make things worse, Eric's family frequently heard strange noises on the steel roof of their house, like someone running or a stone rolling. The parents were convinced that their home was haunted and that evil forces wanted to kill their son. They tried every possible means to ensure protection from these supernatural attacks. Among other things, the parents would bring the boy to a Hindu priest for regular rituals. And once a year, they would do a pilgrimage to the grave of a priest. They vowed not to cut Eric's hair until he turned seven. However, these strategies did not bring the little boy peace. Finally, they resolved to seek help from the God of the Bible. At bedtime, the mother would read Psalm 91 while laying hands on the boy's head. Gradually, Eric began making the connection between a night without nightmares and prayers before sleeping. He became convinced of the existence of a God who is more powerful than any evil force that was harassing him. For complete security and with the assurance of God's power, Eric dedicated his life to Jesus. Evil attacks may be visible or invisible, known or unknown, but they are a reality many people experience. But anyone and anything that is truly dedicated to God can be securely preserved. What is preventing you from fully dedicating yourself to Him now? The same assurance granted to Eric and Paul, the Apostle, also belongs to you. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to His heavenly kingdom. To Him be glory forever and ever. Amen. As you worship God with your tithe and promise, also place yourself in His hands, expressing thankfulness for His divine protection. May we put our desires last and God first. sun I can 
can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine. Hey, I can only imagine. To be surrounded by your glory What will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all you be still? Will I stand in your presence To my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? our speaker for the hour, Pastor Ronnie Williams. Pastor Williams is a native of Murfreesboro, North Carolina. He attended the Murfreesboro SDA Church where he was taught basic fundamental principles and beliefs. This solid foundation prepared him for life and for the ministry. He graduated from Fayetteville State University in Fayetteville, North Carolina, where he earned a BS in criminal justice, and then went on to receive a BA in theology at Oakwood University and a Master's of Divinity degree at Andrews University. Pastor Williams is blessed to receive a call from South Atlantic Conference in February 2008. He began his ministry by serving the Anderson Greenwood District in South Carolina and then went on to the High Point Lexington District in North Carolina. Currently, he is serving as the pastor of the First Lithonia SDA Church and school, I might add. He has been happily married to Monica for 27 years. They have two wonderful children, Ryan and Morgan. Pastor Williams loves people and wants nothing more than to demonstrate that love by serving them. His favorite scripture is, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. It is his prayer that God will not only save he and his family, but to use him to save others and prepare them for his soon coming. Won't you pray with me as we hear God's man servant be used to proclaim the gospel this morning? Thank you. This morning, if you would join me in our scripture reading, the book of 1 Kings, if you would go with me to the book of 1 Kings, 
chapter 19. Chapter 19, verses 9 and 10. 1 Kings chapter 19 and verse 10. And I will read from the clear word in your hearing. The Bible reads, when he arrived, he slipped into one of the caves to spend the night. Then the Lord said to him, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah answered, I know I'll be safe here on your mountain. I've been very zealous for you and the honor of your name. I've tried to lift you up as the God of Israel and to get people to worship you and you alone. They have broken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets. What looked like a revival and reformation didn't change Jezebel's mind one bit. She's still in charge of things and are out to kill your prophets, and I'm the only one left, and she's determined to find me and to kill me. For the next few minutes, I would like to speak from the subject, while in the cave, while in the cave. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your love and mercy. We ask right now that as we uh, share a word from you, may it serve as a source of encouragement to those who are listening. Bless our hearts today. Mend us as one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. While in the cave, as quickly uh, as of a transition as we have gone from May to June, we are still riding high from the celebrations uh, of Mother's Day and elementary and middle school and high school and college graduations. These celebrations bring with it uh, emotional highs and a bit of excitement. Then several mass shootings occur, uh, and then Memorial Day arrives, where we are now turned from celebrating uh, and the, the, the emotional highs to, to mourning the children who were killed and to those who had given their lives for the freedom of this nation. What a quick turnaround in our emotional state. All of us, all of this rather reminds me of today's passage of scripture where our main character goes from an emotional high into the depths of an emotional low. In fact, we call it uh, depression because he's in this this drastic state and finding it difficult to get out. Depression, as you know, is a common code of our emotions. Eventually, it touches everyone and even God's people. It would be nice to think that as Christians, uh, we didn't have dark days, but that discouragement came only to those who are around us. But looking through the Bible at the uh, great saints throughout the Bible, those who we praise as heroes, uh, we find it too that they are also have their moments of despair. And if we are to experience victorious living, uh, living, we must therefore learn how to deal with this thing called depression. I want to remind you today that the cave, uh, unlike in our passage today, is not necessarily a physical location, although uh, some uh, try to escape to a physical place. But it is a place that we visit psychologically uh, and emotionally uh, when we are, and, and, and we are invited guests, or should I say we're not invited guests, but we show from time to time uh, how we deal with the stresses of life that invites itself into our lives. We have a classic case of a depressed person in the Word of God today, and he is the prophet Elijah, the Iron Man of the Old Testament. Elijah lived and served on the days of the wicked king Ahab and his sinister wife Jezebel, who introduced Baal worship into Israel. Elijah was chosen by God uh, as a prophet uh, to challenge the king of Israel and the prophets of Baal to call them out of their state of apostasy. In a contest on Mount Carmel, as you know, he was God's instrument to prove to Israel that Jehovah God was still Lord. But after that amazing victory, Elijah sank into the depths of despair. He sat down under a juniper tree and asked God to take his life. Now, does that surprise you about a man of God? I hope not, because we're reminded by Longfellow that someone must lead and someone must follow, but we all have feats of clay. Uh, in other words, we, we sometimes look upon men uh, like an Elijah as a super saint. In reality, as the scripture reminds us, he was a man 
with the feet of clay and the like passions, just like you and I. This means that he was cut from a human cloth uh, as we are. He, he had the same weaknesses and frailties and emotions as the rest of us. And yes, even Elijah became depressed. Interestingly, on Mount Carmel and Elijah under the juniper tree are, are set side by side. These are two events here. In 1 Kings, Elijah is at the height of success. And in verse uh, chapter 19, he's in the depths of despair. In 1 Kings 18, he's on the mountaintop of victory. And in 19, he's in the valley of defeat. In 1 Kings, he is elated. And in chapter 19, he is deflated. We are all such capable of going on uh, emotional roller coasters. In 1, 8, 18, 1 Kings 18, it records the incredible story of Elijah on Mount Carmel. He assembles Israel on a mountain and accuses them of spiritual schizophrenia. They were halting literally between two opinions. And so I, he asked the question, why are you halting between two opinions? You either decide to be on the side of God or you decide to be on the side of Baal. And so Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, by saying, I'll call on my God and you call on your God, Baal. And let's see which one of them answers. And the one that answers will be considered the God of all Israel. Baal's prophets accepted the challenge and set up their altar and began crying to their God. But no fire falls. Maybe he can't hear you, Elijah says. So then he suggests that they shout louder. And they begin to shout louder and louder and louder. And nothing happens. And so Elijah begins to, to taunt them by reminding them, is he asleep? You better wake him up. And as a final desperate act, the bells of uh, the, the, the prophets of Baal slash themselves with knives, but that doesn't work either. No fire comes. After all this, Elijah builds an altar to the Lord and digs a trench around it and orders that water be poured over it. Twelve barrels of water and, are, and all are used until the sacrifice is soaked through, the, through and through and the ditch around it is running over. Then Elijah prays a simple prayer and God sends common fire or a fire rather to consume the sacrifice the altar and even the water with that turning point the people worship the lord and and shouted the lord he is god the lord he is god then in obedience to israel's command they slaughter baal's prophets and it was a high hour and at this point everyone knew that god's hand was upon elijah Elijah is not permitted to relish the mountaintop experience for long. However, as soon as Queen Jezebel hears what happens, she sends a message to Elijah, letting him know that you have killed my prophets. And by the same time tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. And so when the prophet of God heard and read her message, his heart sank and he began to run for his life. He ran all the way to Bathsheba, the southernmost city in Judah. Bathsheba is the end of civilization. Beyond it, there was nothing but desert. He was getting as far away from the queen as possible. There, he left his servant, perhaps because he didn't plan to come back, or perhaps he did not want the servant to see what he was really like. And then he went another day's journey into the wilderness alone. And my question to you is, have you ever gotten so depressed that you didn't want anyone to see just how down you were? Psychologists call it withdrawing, and this is a psychological and, and, and biochemical process that occurs when a person stops using uh, medications and illegal drugs and, and alcohol and such things as nicotine. And when Elijah finally quit running, he sat down under a, under a juniper tree and he asked God to take his life. He says, Lord, I've had enough. That's it. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. They had unsuccessful, uh, uh, they were unsuccessful in, in, in stamping out the apostasy in Israel. And because he did not uh, stamp out the apostasy there, he also felt like he failed. And out of sheer physical exhaustion, Elijah fell asleep. Here, he was psychologically worn out and physically drained and the Lord allowed him to sleep a little. And after a time, the Lord sent an angel uh, to feed him and to to prep him with a really nice meal and awaken him and gave him the food to eat and water to drink. And then he slept again. 
Once more, the angel awoke him and, and fed him in preparation for a journey to Mount Herob, where he could get away from the people and the pressures that were troubling him. Strengthened by food, Elijah finally, finally reached his destination, 150 miles to the south. But this time, he has gone as far from Jezebel as he could go and remain on the same continent. There he sat in a cave, wrapped himself in self-pity and, and bewailed his fate. While he sat in the dark solitude, God asked him the question, Elijah, what are you doing here? Elijah then began to, to tell God his tale and, and to share with him his sadness. I've been very zealous for the Lord, for the God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken the covenant, thrown down thine altars and slain thy prophets with swords. And I am the only one that's left and they are seeking to take my life. Elijah now is, is really singing the blues. He feels that he has done the best for God and, 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 and it has been to no avail. So he has a pity party. Uh, uh, all of us get down like that sometimes. Businessmen get down. Pastoral leaders get down. Women get down. Teenagers get down. We all get down in our offices and in our homes from time to time. Elijah's depression was, was bound up in any, was not rather bound up in any one situation or any one cause. Rather, it stemmed from four different things. Number one, it stemmed from, the, from his fear. Elijah was frightened by the threat of Jezebel, and so he begins to, to run for his life. And fear is almost always a factor in depression. Many times, like Elijah, we become afraid of failure, uh, of, of loneliness, of not getting a job completed, of not making it through school, or, 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 or not having our marriage go the way that we want it to go. And second, he was, failure contributed also to his depression. Elijah held a negative opinion about himself. In fact, we're told that he felt that, that, that he was no, no more successful in, in, in checking the nation's apostasy than his uh, 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 those who came before him. It's easy to think in situations like this that I am no good and I'm not competent enough and God made a mistake when he made me. It is easy to feel that way. The next thing that, 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 that caused his stress was fatigue. Elijah was emotionally drained and physically exhausted. Mountaintop experiences can leave us that way. He needed rest and he needed relaxation. And depression is always related to or reflected in our physical condition. And then fourth, his futility. Elisha said, I am the only one left and now they are out to get me. He feels alone and he feels hopeless and, and has negative expectations about the future. But now Elijah is also paranoid. He thinks that everybody is out to get him. Just because you aren't paranoid, it doesn't mean that they aren't out to get you either. Elijah is looking at life through dark colored glasses and, and, and he sees no way out. He feels trapped in his situation. Have you ever felt like Elijah? Perhaps you are feeling like him right now, afraid and alone and exhausted and burned out and hopeless. And maybe you are singing the blues. And if you are, perhaps you are a good candidate for the juniper tree. But one of the great lessons from this, from this story is that even though you may be a good candidate, or it seems like you may be a good candidate for the juniper tree, guess what? You don't have to remain under that tree. I want you to see what helped Elijah climb out of the valley of despair and go into a life of useful service. Through the experience of Elijah, God gives us some divine directives to help us in dealing with depression. The first thing that, 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 that Elijah needed to do was to take some time off. He needed to, to get to get uh, better physically and emotionally rejuvenated. He had been so busy taking care of the nation that he neglected his own needs. And when we use up our physical energy to become exhausted, uh, where rather uh, we become exhausted, when we use all of our emotional energy, we become depressed. We must therefore find some way periodically to replace the emotional and the physical energy that life and work drain from us. And if we do not, we will experience burnout and depression. Elijah needed rest. He needed food. He needed relaxation. He needed to get away from the people and the pressures that were getting to him. And so do we occasionally. No one can run full throttle all the time. 
we all need to slow down and idle occasionally. There is often a close relationship between uh, a physical and our emotional state. Our body and mind live so close with one another that if one gets sick, the other one has a chance of also getting sick. If we are, if, if we are down emotionally, it affects the way we feel physically. If we get sick physically, it affects our emotions. Keeping healthy in general, getting enough, the right kind of food and the right kind of uh, enough sleep and sufficient exercise. While this does not guarantee that you will get over your depression, but it may help to pre prevent it. And it will certainly keep the body in a better state to deal with it when it does tries to raise its ugly head. And if you are depressed, first, get a good physical checkup. Have a medical examination to, to see if there's anything wrong with you physically or, or emotionally or chemically. If everything is all right physically, then take some time off and let your body and your mind have a reunion. Let them catch up with one another. That's not always easy to do though. Uh, Thomas Spurgeon, the son of Charles H. Spurgeon, once wrote about a friend concerning a period of forced inactivity due to ill health. He says, I fear I shall find it hard to work to do nothing. Many people are that way, you know. They are workaholics. They feel guilty about doing nothing. But we all need to live balanced lives. We need to learn how to balance work and, and to balance rest. And if we don't find it, it will, we will become either a basket case or a casket case. One of the best pieces of advice I've received since ministry was to make sure that I pace myself while doing ministry. In other words, be balanced in all that I do. And Jesus recognized this and said to his disciples, he said, come ye apart and rest a while. The fact is, we must either come apart or we're going to fly to pieces. The next thing we must do to help us in our depressed state is to let it all hang out. Elijah talk through his frustrations. While he sat in the cave feeling sorry for himself, God asked him, Elijah, what are you doing here? Now, have you noticed in scripture, and like uh, many lawyers do in their practices, they never ask a question for which they do not know the answer. For example, Adam, where are you? God knew where Adam was. Cain, where is your brother Abel? God knew where Abel was. Moses, what is that in your hand? God knew what Moses had in his hand. And so he asked the question, Elijah, what are you doing here? And God used this strategy to help Elijah talk out his frustrations and get him to the point where he needed to be. And so then why did God ask this question? To give him an opportunity to talk, to vent his frustrations. And then God listened, listened non-judgmentally as Elijah poured out his feelings of anger, bitterness, and self-pity. We all have such feelings at times. Unless we rid ourselves of them, they will poison us emotionally. There are some, some health-giving uh, e emotions like love and faith and hope, but there are also some, some that are destructive as well, such as jealousy and fear and anger and self-pity and, and hatred. All of these are slow killers, and we must find some way to rid ourselves of these destructive feelings. But how can we do it? How can we rid ourselves of these pent up feelings? Well, I got a solution. One way is exercise. Just plain hard work is one way. It relieves a lot of tension. Uh, a person could almost jog himself out of depression. Some even believe that the brain produces its own mood elevating chemicals, which are enhanced by exercise, among other things. For example, dopamine and, and, and oxytocin and serotonin and endorphins, all of these things are as, a are as a result of exercise, which makes us feel better and it improves and gives us a positive mood. That is not easy to do. But when we are depressed, we often exhibit apathy. There is a slowdown in the body process. We lose interest in usual activities. We don't feel like doing anything. It's hard to, 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 to just get through the day sometimes. At times, at dark times, we like energy also. Tears are another way. Depressed people tend to cry a lot anyway, and that is good. Tears are a God-given means of release. I hope that you never lose your ability to cry. 
Someone has said that the answer to all of man's emotional problems is salt water, sweat, tears, and the ocean. There is some truth to that, you know. Talking is perhaps the most effective way to rid ourselves of harmful emotions. When we talk, it is like pulling the plug out of a bathtub. All sorts of bad feelings are, are drained from us, and everyone needs someone who they can confide in without fear of condemnation. Someone said a, a while back that, uh, that, that, that probably more good is done between two friends at 10 o'clock in the morning sitting around at a table over a cup of tea than sitting in the doctor's office all day long. Talking to a friend can help bring and put life back into perspective and enable us to solve the problems that we are facing. And if we had more friends, we would need fewer psychiatrists. Find a non-judgmental listener and pour your soul out to them. And as you talk to others, don't forget the most important thing, and that is talking to God. He too will listen non-judgmentally. Elijah practic practically accused God of infidelity, you know, but God is not on defense. He deals patiently and tenderly with his overwrought children. He will do the same thing for you also. God didn't say, Elijah, prophets shouldn't talk like that. No, he didn't make him feel guilty for his feelings. In fact, God accepted him and listened to whatever it was that he had to say. Say what you want to God. He can take it. He will not be judgmental as you pour your life's hurts out to him. A word of caution, however. Be careful about talking, to your talking about your problems too much. The person who goes around pitying himself bores others and repeats stories of his trouble, and the result is that he's often left alone. In other words, when people see you coming because they know that you're going to talk about your problems, they're going to they're gonna see you coming in one door, and they're going to go out the next. Another thing that will help us with our depressed state is to get life back into perspective. That helped Elijah uh, get things back into perspective. He, he felt that God had forsaken him and that he alone remained faithful to the Lord. His reasoning went something like this. Here am I doing my best to serve the Lord and look what happened. God has forsaken me and now I am alone. It's me against the world. You see, depressed people often feel like that. They have problems because they pay more attention to negative events than positive ones, focus on immediate rather than long-term consequences of behavior, are overly hard on themselves, attribute success to outside forces and failure to their own likes, and in general reward themselves too little and punish themselves too much. Unfortunately, Elijah had arrived at the wrong conclusion. So at that point, the Lord chose to reveal just how warped and distorted his view of things had become. Ultimately, all depression can be traced back to some distorted view of life. In Elijah's case, he had a distorted view of himself and a distorted view of who God was. He needed to know that God was there and that there were others who had not bowed to Baal. First, God reveals himself to Elijah in a new and a fresh way. He sent a tremendous wind and a cyclone and, and, and rip that ripped through the mountains. But God was not in the wind. And then God sent an earthquake that, that shook the whole mountain, but God was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, he sent fire and lightning, but God was not in the fire. Then there came a still, small voice that spoke to Elijah through a Hebrew expression which literally means low whispers of gentle stillness. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, wind and lightning uh, and earthquakes are often associated with God. In fact, they are always uh, uh, are ways that he manifests himself to us. Yet, here God speaks to Elijah through low whispers. As if God is saying, just because I have not spoken to you, as I have to others in days gone by, it does not mean that I'm not here. Though it, it was as if though God was silent, but he was not absent. Though Jezebel was thundering, she was not in control. God was quietly going about his work. God is the God of wonders, but he's also uh, the God of whispers. Elijah not only needed a new perspective of God, he needed a new perspective on himself. He thought that he was the only one who was still faithful to God. 
But God had to remind them that he had 7,000 prophets who had not yet bowed their knee to Baal. In fact, God had already chosen Elijah's successor and he commanded him to go and anoint Elijah for this work. Elijah thought he was more important than he really was. He thought that everything depended upon him. We sometimes feel the same way. Listen, if God's work solely depended on you and depended on me, then God is in serious trouble. And so keep life in perspective. We can't take God's work too seriously, but we can take ourselves too seriously. None of us is indispensable. The workmen die but the work will go on. And then get back into the mainstream. Elijah got back into the mainstream of life and went to work again. God allowed, allows you to, to sit in a dark cave of self-pity just for so long. Then he told him to get up and get busy again. There was, there was a new king of Israel and a new prophet that needed to be anointed. The time for complaints and self-pity were over. Elijah needed now to get back to work and because he had a new task that was assigned to him. Don't sit around in isolation. Don't get all wrapped up in yourself. Don't, don't have your own pity party for too long. Get up and get back into the mainstream of life and working for God and his kingdom. In helping others, we help ourselves. Because of this, Elijah overcame his depression and went on into a lifetime of useful service. In fact, he ultimately closed out his ministry, as the Bible reminds us, in a blaze of glory as God swept down and carried him into a whirlwind and a chariot of fire. Thank God we can do the same. And if he can have success in life and in service, so can you. So get off the couch, get up from that seat, get on your feet, because God has a work for you to do. May God continue to richly bless us and keep us as we continue to strive to make heaven our home. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much, God, for this word today. Lord, we thank you for the encouragement behind it, and I pray that, that for those who are listening, that it will encourage them to continue to serve, even going through this thing called depression. And God, help us to understand that even though it may come and go from time to time, let us know that as we go into this thing that we also can come out. And I pray that by the end of all of this, as we continue to live and we continue to strive to make heaven our home, may encourage other people who we see that need encouragement today. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer, for we ask these things in Christ's name. Amen and amen. This mountain can be moved They say these chains will never break But they don't know you like we do There is power in your name We've heard that there is no way through We've heard the ties will never change They haven't seen what you can do There is power in your name So much power in your
got to believe it. 